All right, so let's pick up where we left off with Herodotus. If you don't remember, Herodotus was a, a philosopher and a historian um, back in uh, 500 BC. Okay, he was the first historian. He was like the world's first journalist, where he would document both sides of the story. You know, not just what his opinion or his views were, but you know the views of his enemy and their opinions. You get it? So he was the first one to you know bring together both sides, just so he could document the you know true recesses of history of act what actually happened. You know, so. He starts with, in his uh, book of histories, he starts with a story about um, an Egyptian king, King Somaticus. Now, this is a picture of Akhenaten, by the way. I just threw that up there. We can talk, we'll talk about him later. But um, anyway, so Somaticus, uh, the Egyptians were very proud of the fact that they were the most ancient of races. So even the ancient Egyptians were proud of being ancient Egyptians. You get it? So even back then, they were like, oh, yeah, we're the oldest race. Well, there was an issue. There was a debate about um, between them and another race about who was actually the most ancient of races. So it, the king concocted a test to prove who was the eldest race and he instructed a, a, a herdsman to take the, these two children these newborn children and take them to the middle of nowhere and raise them without ever speaking a word to them he could never talk to them and they could never hear any language and after in a couple years and he's like when they do talk come back and tell me what they say three years go by and one day the herdsman shows up. And he, you know, he's taking care of him, brings him some food. And when he shows up, they say, "Bakos, Bakos," and he's like, "Oh, that's not just childish jibber jabber. They're actually saying a word." So he took the kids to see the king, and um, they spoke for him. They said, "Bakos," and the king didn't know. He turned to his priest and asked him, "What did Bakos mean? What was that?" And his priest said, Bakos means bread in the language of the Phrygians. And so King Somaticus had to yield their position and admit that although the Egyptians were the most powerful of the ancient races, they were not the most ancient race. That title is held by the Phrygians. So... And, and I think it's interesting that <laughs> the, the way he figured it out by <laughs> raising a kid never to speak. And so the language that they would just naturally come up with on their own, the words they would come up with their self, was the language of the Phrygians, the first language. Now, what's cool about the Phrygians is a lot of people don't really know really who they are or what they stand for. There's like um, so many different races that you know were around at that time with them. Uh, that they don't really stand out. There's not a lot of evidence uh, on them. But basically, the Phrygians were a race of giants. Okay? <laughs> they come from modern day Turkey. All right? So, um, and I'm saying that, you know, they're a race of giants in uh, the same sense as like the Philistines and the Hittites were a race of giants. Biblical records state that they were giants. Um, so I know a lot of people don't like to go off stuff that's said in the Bible. I do for historical references. I'm completely not religious. <laughs> but um, for historical references, I feel that the stuff is important to take into account what people said back then. So, you know, as you see with David and Goliath, Goliath was the most fierce warrior of the Philistine army. But he wasn't the only giant. <laughs> In fact, he had five brothers. All right. Um, so like there, there were just giants around. That's just what they, you know, even in Genesis, you know, uh, um, it says that, you know, 
there were giants in the earth in those days and after that, after the days after the flood. Okay, so before the flood, it was all giants. Then after the flood, there was some giants, and you know, we still have like remnants of these giants left over. Like there are still people who are basically giants, <laughs> and um, I think that uh, <coughs> that was like you know, they're um, that's why they were uh, like worshipped as um, you know, gods, or they would be kings, and they would pass down kingship and stuff because of their great size and everything. But basically, every race around the world uh, had giants mixed in with their races. You got it, like you know, the Egyptians, the Phrygians, the Hittites, and the um, Philistines. You know, everywhere they, <laughs> there was some giant somewhere. You know, when it comes to the biblical giants and stuff, um, you can't have a story without Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is the first story ever written. It's the first epic tale, epic poem ever recorded by man that we know about, anyway. And the story of Gilgamesh is Gilgamesh was a king, um, and he was a giant. <clears throat> he was this uh, smooth-talking, badass warrior who thought he was the shit and basically was the shit. Um, well, he, he met his brother, who was a wild man, who lived in nature with the animals and um, was basically covered in hair and, you know, uh, was this powerful, powerful... <laughs> warrior as well and um when Gilgamesh found out about him uh he was like oh this dude's supposed to be a badass well fuck that you know I'm gonna go kick his fucking ass and uh, because he has to be the baddest motherfucker around this is this is basically a story okay <laughs> so he goes <coughs> and meets his brother and they, they're they don't know their brothers or anything they they just decide that in the end that they are brothers or whatever um, and they go and they, they fight. They fucking battle. Now, Gilgamesh at this time had kicked everybody's ass like it wasn't shit. All right. He just, he fucking rocked fools and no one could challenge him. And then he goes and fights this wild man. And all of a sudden, he's met someone who has his, his, his strength and his power. And he had never battled someone like that before. And because of that, you know, the, the, he was getting beaten by this guy. He became like, um, you know, envious of him. He was like, wow. This, he was like kind of starstruck by him. He's like, this dude's bad as fuck, man. You know, he was like, he was super impressed with him. And he was like, you know, I, I can't beat your strength. Although our, you know, our strengths are the same. So we like balance each other out, you know, who none of us can win or whatever. But then Gilgamesh was like, now nah, fuck that. I'm a, I'm a little bit smarter than you. You're just a fucking crazy ass wild man. So what he did is he went and got a fucking hoe. He went and got some hoochie mama. And he was like, hey, go over there and fuck that hairy dude. And she was like, yeah, you got it, whatever, you know. And she went over there and they fucking banged. And then that made his brother um, not be part of nature anymore. All right. The, this is like the ghetto vice version of it, but I'm telling you, that's the epic of Gilgamesh, you guys. <laughs> it's, it was crazy, and um, <clears throat> uh, but what's it's it's like there's interesting things. It's it's the details that are important. Like one of the things is is that um, him and his brother go to f fight the these giants and these monsters. Okay, and where does he go to fight these giants and these monsters? He goes to the land. Of the cedars. Well, do you guys know where the land of the cedars would be? Lebanon. Lebanon is the land of the cedars. Cedar cheese, giant cedar cheese. And in Lebanon is a temple in a place called Baalbek. And it is the largest temple ever built by humans. The stones there are the largest stones ever moved by man. Uh, they have three stones there called the Trilithon stones. They are the largest stones in history that have ever been moved. They are humongous, weighing upwards of 1,200 tons, okay? All right, so this is uh, Lebanon. This is the stone of the south, uh, the stone of the pregnant woman. And it was the largest stone um, 
ever meant to be used for construction although they say you know of course as you can see it wasn't actually used and um the reason why they say it you know it was it was the largest or whatever they say it was actually too big to have uh, been moved or transported uh that they got overzealous and they're like oh yeah we're gonna move sort of this huge and they're like no no they they <laughs> couldn't do it you know like it was um it was too heavy they were saying that the uh the gravity alone would uh would would break it or whatever um and the they tried to attribute the building of um like the temple of jupiter and uh the temple of baracus at in Baalbek, they try to attribute it to the Romans because no civilization before them should have been capable of building, you know, such a such a monumental structure. And um, like when the Romans found it, it was a, uh, uh, it was basically just the um, the platform. And you know, people in ancient astronaut theory like to claim that the platform was a a launching pad for a rocket ship. It's fucking just so. St- stupid <laughs> I was like you know I, I you could put the fucking rocket on the ground I, I doubt it's gonna fucking you know destroy the earth you know so uh, if the earth the ground can't support it I mean what the fuck I mean give me a give me a break you know it's fucking it, it would have been fine they did they wouldn't have had to have huge stones they could have fucking buried some stones and made it flat with the earth and underground and it would have been fine it would have been like a total foundation for it it would have broke or anything it would have been totally fine but that's it's not that it's not a ancient spaceport okay that's fucking stupid <laughs> now you can see right here this is what the romans did to it when they wanted to use the blocks for construction they had to take the big blocks and cut them into little pieces because they could not move the big pieces so that's you know roman technology came down to about they could lift about five tons and uh, all the academics agree with that that's that's the most that they could lift so uh you know anything more than that you know their cranes and their pulleys wouldn't wouldn't work i mean look at the size of these are you know uh, gigantic you know we're talking thousands of tons and um you know when they built the 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 temple of jupiter or whatever the you know they say that they built the temple of jupiter but we don't actually know because there's no record of them actually building it now the romans kept records of everything from across the you know all the the planet that they built stuff wherever they had settlements wherever they went and the army took over they had you know receipts and shit from the kings and stuff where they were getting paid their tributes and everything like that so everything was recorded they were really good at documenting what you know what they owned and what was theirs what was roman stuff and there is no payments there is no anything about actually building the temple of jupiter it was just that as a religious place they say that it's ours that they took it over basically um, look at this i mean if this place wasn't a, a place for giants i don't know what is i mean fucking look at that D- how do you really need a doorway that fucking big i mean <clears throat> look at the size of the people i mean who needs a doorway fucking 45 feet tall i mean that's fucking ridiculous you know so um that's another thing that leads me to believe that this most likely was built by um a giant species um a, you know a pre-diluvian people uh built this uh and another thing that's interesting in the um tape the uh ancient astronaut ancient aliens debunked uh chris white that fundamentalist fucking psycho christian <laughs> um he goes and says uh that this you know they know exactly how the stones at <clears throat> Baalbek were moved and lifted into place and everything and <clears throat> he shows these drawings of um them like building like these like x kind of exoskeleton thing around them and like lifting it up and having all these pulleys with men and and um like oxen or whatever you know like turning these cranks and like moving this this giant piece of stone and it's it, it was a theory that was <laughs> disproven a long time ago but um one of the things that he couldn't have known even though a lot of ancient astronaut theorists said he's wrong he was like no 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 this is what the evidence shows they couldn't even lift that big stone blah 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 um and it turns out he was fucking wrong now i think he should go back and say okay yeah i was wrong and make another video about it because we know now now he didn't know this when he made the video 
but we know this now that not only that stone that stone is not the biggest stone and we also know that that the there was bigger stones that were moved here at Baalbek and we know this because underneath the stone of the south are the other stones that once they dug down and cleared it all out they realized there's a bunch more right underneath you see see the size of the stone the stone that we're looking at right now on the bottom is actually bigger than this stone on top and see how it's tilted to the side like that that's it, everyone thought that it was still attached to the uh, bedrock it's it's not actually attached to it it was on top of it and see how it's like cut at these angles so um, if you dig down, which they have, you dig down, you see this, this is its own separate piece. And there's another one on, you know, there's three of them right here. But there's actually more of them as you work your way down. And they found it out with um, uh, ground penetrating radar. And um, so they know that these have been moved because they are um, not in the position that they <laughs> should be. That they're, and they're totally cut loose from the thing. If they had cranes that could lift them, they would just lift right up. And now the weight and the gravity alone makes it appear like it is um, stuck together, but it's it's not. It's it's separate. They could move it, and obviously because this one there are missing ones. If as you can tell, they obviously moved them. So they were wrong about um, the the size of that being the biggest stone, and it was too big to move because there were even bigger stones that were moved. Uh, it's just. <laughs> That's the fact. I think he should go back and change that shit because uh, he was fucking wrong again. Uh, here we're looking at the King's List. And uh, what's interesting about like the King's List and everything is back in the day, for some reason, <laughs> all the antediluvian people lived incredibly long lives. And uh, now the Bible records it as um, like from Adam and Eve. Adam was uh, 930 years old. And... Uh, from that time you know people lived you know like close to a thousand years and before the deluge people lived thousands and thousands of years but it's not just the bible that recorded that the um sumerian kings list also recorded that so all their kings lived you know 34,000 years 45,000 years 28,000 years it's like the craziest eight you know ranges of uh age and but they're not the only ones also the egyptian king list also, it states that, you know, after the deluge, their kings lived like 900 years or a thousand years until it got down to, you know, whatever, 100 years, 80 years, 40 years, nine years, whatever. And before the deluge, all the kings lived for 5,000 years, 20,000 years, 45,000 years. I mean, like crazy lengths of time. And uh, this is something that's repeated throughout, throughout the world. I mean, everybody has a flood myth. Like there's no civilization that doesn't have a flood myth i mean you gotta you gotta question that <laughs> and when it comes to like looking for actual physical evidence there are pieces out there that i find very fascinating and interesting i think that should be included when teaching you know the archaeological record you know like these giant footprints that you find in stone this is another thing a phenomenon that we find all around the world if it was just one if it was just one off but carved one then okay you know uh we i could say yeah it's a it's an anomaly or whatever it's just a, a piece of art someone carved it out but we find these giant footprints all over the world and we find them in places where people like didn't even like try to build megalithic structures and we find them in like sediment and in rock or whatever like <laughs> that it shouldn't fucking be there the only reason it's there is you know like they're like did someone come out into the middle of the fucking jungle and you know carve this footprint there wasn't even a civilization around that should have been able to do that like for, for instance now this uh footprint is from india um i believe it is a a, a carved one though um just from the the style of it, just the way it looks it does it does look like a carved one but when you get to ones like this uh this is from patagonia and you know like in um uruguay and argentina and um 
Paraguay. That like they actually have a ton of these legends of giants. And I, like everything was super fucking huge out there. Um, all their their dinosaurs, all their stuff was like the largest dinosaur in the world. Uh, the um, Argentinosaurus is found out there. I'll show you some um, bones from that thing too. It's fucking crazy. This too is from Patagonia, and they have the, their legends about giants. Fucking. Um, go back from the beginning of time, you know, these are the footprints of um, Lord Hominin, all right, and he was a, a god who lived, and they, whenever they find a footprint, they say, oh, you know, the Lord, you know, stepped here or whatever, but I'm like, these, <laughs> these feet print are in, uh, you know, they're not into cut or hewn stone, they're into natural stone, look at the lichen patches within the toes, okay, that means that, I mean, lichen patches take thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of years to form. So, um, since you can see the lichen patches running through the, cr the curve in it or whatever, it, it, it had to be there first. It had to be, the toe print had to be first, and then the lichen patches um, went over top of it. You get it? If it, was, if it was just carved out, then there shouldn't be any the lichen patches on it. It should be clean because... Uh, unless it was carved out tens of thousands of years ago, you know, so it doesn't, it, you know, there again, it still doesn't make sense. Uh, look at some of these, like these mummy <laughs> feet and shit. Look at the size of those fucking things, man. I mean, that shit's crazy. I wonder where they found that stuff at, dude. Look, it's still got like, flesh on it. That's fucking nasty. Ugh. God damn. I forget where this is from, though. It's another interesting one, and like the date on the the ages of some of these foot these feet print in the stone are so old. Some of them they date them at like millions of years old, and we you know when I see stuff like that, I'm like, there's got to be an issue with, with the dating, you know? That's and yes, that is a dinosaur footprint on top of a human footprint. I'm like the you know we got to do something about the the standard you know radiocarbon d dating. I mean. It's just, I don't think it holds up. This is another one of uh, Lord Hominin from uh, Patagonia. I mean, they have giants all over out there. Like in South America, man, they're like full of fucking giants. <laughs> I mean, look at the size of that. Who just goes and carves that in the middle of the fucking jungle? You know? I, it, does, it doesn't make any sense. Once again, if you look close, you can see the um, the, the form of uh, lichen patches um, right by the toes and some of the orange ones. Now look at these. Now these are actual instruments from giants, okay? These axes, you think they are just models, you know? Like they're just like a sculpture. No, these were real. And the handles have been replaced, so they stand upright, but they found them. They had, the wood was almost rotted away, but these axe heads are used. And they can see that they've been used. They can see all the residue, uh, the tree resin and stuff that's on them. Look at the size of this axe head, okay? A hundred and twenty pound axe head. Who the fuck is swinging that around? <laughs> For real. I mean, even our strongest guy. Is he going to fucking swing that around? Fuck no. I mean, that does. <laughs> look at the size of that. That's fucking ridiculous. But it's real. There's the evidence right there. <laughs> you know? And they say, oh, so should we account this, you know, as, you know, part of the archaeological record? Fuck no. Look at these hand axes. Now, you know what, like, the... the the Clovis people and their stone hand axes look like. So, I mean, look at these. It's the same thing, only 50 times bigger. I mean, who the fuck is lifting these? <laughs> you know? I mean, and it, it has the exact same shape as a Clovis spearhead or axe head. Except it's, you know, 20 times bigger. <laughs> look at these pots right here. These pots are almost two tons. Who the fuck is making a pot that's fucking two tons and, you know, like, oh, yeah, we, we just need a big jug right there where we'll never move it ever again. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's fucking, that's fucking crazy. Who needs a pot that fucking big? I don't know if these are stone or if they're, um, terracotta or what. Um, I, the, this one's terracotta. And, um, the same community in, uh, Turkey was using this stone jug to make wine out of for a thousand or for 2000 years and um when they ask them you know where did you get it from they said it oh it was left over from a giant <laughs> so they're like yeah no it was a giant and uh, we just kind of kept using it <laughs> that's what they say now this place is fucking cool this this kind of ties everything together um and is a temple in 
Turkey. Again, Turkey. And these people were like obsessed with this. They had a fascination with like this lion culture. So they had lions on everything. And as you can see, the, one of the reasons why this place looks different is because all the stone is black. That's because it's um, made from basalt and diorite, like the hardest stones on earth. I mean, diorite's harder than um, granite, you know? I think it's uh, second only to diamond. <laughs> and this is what their entire thing was made out of. You know, but people don't people don't talk about this. But I think if you connect all the dots, it has a lot to do with it. Now, once again, like I said, this is like a lion culture. They put lions on everything. Well, if you look back at the pictures from Baalbek, you'll see lions' heads everywhere, and it just it looks like there's some kind of a uh, but it, like there's some kind of connection there with these you know these people who had this, this obsession with the with lions, and um now think about this. Now, like, you know, Ball Beck was 9,000 years old and had all this lion motif. And, um, oh, here's Father Corrupts Kare me with, uh, uh, these are belts. That's an actual belt. <laughs> so the guy who, 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 you know, Eric D Von Danigan claimed he found a metal library or whatever, even though Father Corrupts was like, uh, just people gave them to me or made them or whatever, you know, he doesn't agree with Eric. But um, look at the size of these belts. Is that fucking crazy? Look at the size of that guitar. Now, that's not one that you could just play as a stand-up because look how wide the neck is. You couldn't get your fucking hand around it. You know, so it doesn't make sense unless it's being played by someone who's fucking really big, you know? Now, um, we're getting back to the lion motif. Um, you know, the the incredibly old age of the Phrygians who would have been these like these lion people like with the Hittites and stuff. And then you see the lion motifs at Baalbek and places that are 9,000 years old. And now think about the sphinx now the sphinx they date at um close to 12,500 years old now again you know incredibly old and they are pretty sure that there was another head on top of it and most people say they think it was a lion's head and they carved it into a pharaoh's head thousands of years later and um we know that uh the uh, the pharaoh who uncovered the sphinx he uh because there's a stella in between the sphinx's or the sphinx's paws that reads that the the king um fell asleep by the sphinx and he had a dream and the sphinx told him that and he wasn't a, you know a pharaoh at the time and the sphinx told him if he uncovers his body that the sphinx would make him pharaoh and so the uh king went and uncovered his body and dug all the sand around and they were like oh yeah they made him pharaoh you know um but that right there proves that because at the time the sphinx was buried up to its head again and when we rediscovered it today it's buried up to its head we had to dig it all out so it, it filled up and got covered with the blowing sands <laughs> to the top of its head twice you know i mean that that's how fucking old it is and when you see the size of the head compared to the body it looks like a little fucking peanut head it doesn't it's not even close and obviously they know how to you know draw stuff in proportion and yet that's not even close it's, that doesn't even look like it should be there it looks completely out of place on top of it now another interesting fact that i like to point out real quick is that the stella right here and uh, not only does it tell about the dream, um, but it also tells about how uh, this is the um, guardian sphinx of the West. Okay. And it talks about the guardian sphinx of the East. It says there are two sphinxes. So I'm saying, I think, under the sand, on the opposite side somewhere... You should find another sphinx that protects the, uh, that's, you know, there to fucking um, protect the temple that was there. Um, and I think they need to, <laughs> I think they need to go and dig under there and hit it with ground penetrating radar. Because on this side, <clears throat> which is closer to the Nile, and um, everything got uncovered over there, like, all, you know, they removed all the sand. But behind the pyramid and everything, it's uh, it, it's not. It's fucking, it's just, a, you know, tons of sand everywhere. They haven't excavated any of that shit. How much you want to bet there's another fucking sphinx over there? I mean, Estella says there is. So, uh, I think they need to fucking look and actually take it seriously. Now, another thing you have to discuss when talking about, you know, advanced human 
uh, timelines, like uh, us going back to, you know, way, way before the Sumerians and stuff. You can't discuss that without bringing up the Piri Reis map. <clears throat> now, Piri Reis was a, um, uh, a sailor, a navigator, and a cartographer. And he, this is his map. Now, what's interesting about the map is it shows the outline, the coastline of South America and Antarctica, uh, Queen's Modland. And you can see under, um, it shows the actual coastline as it looked underneath the ice. And um, how did he, you know, come about this map? Did he go and he mapped it? No. All right. He put this map together from a bunch of older ancient source maps okay and um the it the another the thing that's really interesting about uh piri reis is he was a turkish admiral in the <laughs> in the turkish navy and he made his map in 1500 uh 300 years before antarctica was discovered and but he said hey i put this map together from all these source maps it actually even says it on the map <laughs> but he's a Turkish. So the source maps that he got were from Turkey. See where I'm going with all this? I'm going to just lay it all out. I believe they are wrong about the Sumerians being the first civilization. Okay? I believe that the first civilization comes from Turkey 13,000 years ago. So 7,000 years before the Sumerians existed, the uh, civilization there was a highly advanced civilization, so to say, so to speak, okay? Um, but that they were, in fact, the most ancient, the first race came from Turkey. That Turkey is the cradle of civilization and not Mesopotamia. All right, that's all the evidence leads me to to that destination as opposed and another the one of the best pieces of evidence is, <laughs> or piece of evidence is Gobekli Tepe. All right. Now the oldest megalithic ruins on earth, the oldest temple on earth is Gobekli Tepe and it has giant monolithic stones weighing between 20 and 40 tons. Um they're upright pillars, these T-shaped pillars and uh they're actually buried after they were created, but they date Gobekli Tepe at 13,000 years old. Even the academics agree with this age, all right? And with, you know, with that, you know, being said, uh, wouldn't it make more sense with all this other evidence included that Turkey is in fact the cradle of civilization and no, not Iraq? Now, this is a royal tomb, royal temple on Mount Nemrut also in Turkey and it's cool because they all have um cone heads for some reason <laughs> uh like all the motifs you see of them have cone heads they also have these giant um you know lion edifices and uh eagle men style edifices so when you would see like you know the bird men of every other place and um, like or sphinxes or anything it seems that these guys were the first to create all that stuff I mean it makes sense to me that they are the first civilization coming you know being twice as old as the Sumerians I mean uh, the, and they they like try to date a lot of the stuff they say oh no this is up uh, this is uh, pretty new even though they have like no actual way to date it they can't date the actual pieces of stone or anything they have to just date um, you know, any kind of living material, any kind of plant life or something like that, that's bio, you know, that they can, um, use radiocarbon dating on. Um, other than that, they can't date the stone. They all have no idea when the hell it's from. It'd be millions of years old if they're trying to date the stone. So it's like, they don't know. They just, they just assume. But when I look at all the evidence, I say that they are the cradle of civilization. That is where the first people came from. Now, you guys are probably wondering, what does any of this have to do with ancient aliens? I'll tell you, because even the Phrygians and the people who built Gobekli Tepe and all these people, even they had gods. And the interesting thing is, is that this is what their gods looked like.
language of the Phrygians. And so King Somaticus had to yield their position and admit that although the Egyptians were the most powerful of the ancient races, they were not the most ancient race. That title is held by the Phrygians. So, and, and I think it's interesting that <laughs> the way he figured it out by raising a kid never to speak and so the language that they would just naturally come up with on their own the words they would come up with their self was the language of the Phrygians the first language now what's cool about the Phrygians is a lot of people don't really know really who they are or what they stand for there's like um so many different races that you know were around at that time with them uh, that they don't really stand out there's not a lot of evidence um, on them but basically the Phrygians were a race of giants, okay? <laughs> they come from modern day Turkey, all right? So, um, and I'm saying that, you know, they're a race of giants in uh, the same sense as like the Philistines and the Hittites were a race of giants. Biblical records state that they were giants. Um, so I know a lot of people don't like to go off stuff that's said in the Bible. I do for historical references I'm completely not religious <laughs> but um, for historical references I feel that the stuff is important to take into account what people said back then so you know as you see with David and Goliath Goliath was the most fierce warrior of the Philistine army but he wasn't the only giant <laughs> in fact he had five brothers all right um so like there there were just giants around that's just what they you know even in, in genesis you know uh um it says that you know there were giants in the earth in those days and after that after the days after the flood okay so before the flood it was all giants and then after the flood there were some giants and you know we still have like remnants of these giants left over like there are still people who are basically giants <laughs> and um i think that uh <coughs> that was like you know they're um that's why they were uh like worshiped as um you know gods or they would be kings and they would pass down kingship and stuff because of their great size and everything but basically every race around the world uh had giants mixed in with their races you got it like you know the Egyptians the Phrygians the Hittites and the um, Philistines you know I'm everywhere they, <laughs> there was some giant somewhere you know when it comes to the biblical giants and stuff um, you can't have a story without Gilgamesh Gilgamesh is the first story ever written it's the first epic tale epic poem ever recorded by man that we know about anyway and the story of Gilgamesh is Gilgamesh was a king um, and he was a giant. <clears throat> he was this uh, smooth talking badass warrior who thought he was the shit and basically was the shit. Um, well, he, he met his brother who was a wild man who lived in nature with the animals and um, was basically covered in hair and, you know, uh, was this powerful, powerful <laughs> warrior as well and um when Gilgamesh found out about him uh he was like oh this dude's supposed to be a badass well fuck that you know I'm gonna go kick his fucking ass and uh, because he has to be the baddest motherfucker around this is this is basically a story okay <laughs> all right so let's pick up where we left off with Herodotus if you don't remember Herodotus was a, a philosopher and a historian um if back in uh, 500 BC okay he was the first historian he was like the world's first journalist where he would document both sides of the story you know not just what his opinion or his views were but you know the views of his enemy and their opinions you get it so he was the first one to you know bring together both sides just so he could document the you know true recesses of history of act what actually happened you know So he starts with, in his uh, book of histories, he starts with a story 
about um, an Egyptian king, King Somaticus. Now, this is a picture of Akhenaten, by the way. I just threw that up there. We can talk, we'll can we talk about him later. But um, anyway, so Somaticus, uh, the Egyptians were very proud of the fact that they were the most ancient of races. So even the ancient Egyptians were proud of being ancient Egyptians. You get it? So even back then, they were like, oh, yeah, we're the oldest race. Well, there was an issue. There was a debate about um, between them and another race about who was actually the most ancient of races. So it, the king concocted a test to prove who was the eldest race. And he instructed a, a, a herdsman to take the, these two children, these newborn children, and take them to the middle of nowhere and raise them without ever speaking a word to them. He could never talk to them and they could never hear any language. And after in a couple years, and he's like, when they do talk, come back and tell me what they say. Three years go by and one day the herdsman shows up. And he, you know, he's taking care of them, brings them some food. And when he shows up, they say, Bakos, Bakos. And he's like, oh, that's not just childish jibber jabber. They're actually saying a word. So he took the kids to see the king. And um, they spoke for him. They said, Bakos. And the king didn't know. He turned to his priest and asked him, what did Bakos mean? What was that? And his priest said, Bakos means bread in the language.